As we continue in our essential series, we've covered the Bible and the plan of salvation, part one, part two. But as I considered the order of the lessons that we need to go in, I realized that really this one should have probably come before the plan of salvation. Because this lesson is the heart and soul of everything relating to God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul defines the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Most of you are probably familiar with the term synecdoche. You probably got it in high school. The synecdoche is simply a figure of speech that involves using a part for a whole or a whole for part to refer to something in whole. The totality of something. When someone looks at your car and says, nice wheels, they're actually using synecdoche to refer to the wheels as a part of the vehicle, but actually it's referring to the entire vehicle. It's used in other places. The crown refers to a monarchy or a royal authority. The pen is mightier than the sword to refer to the power of writing. If we talk about the White House, we're talking about the current presidential administration. And if I say, lend me your ears, which I am saying this morning, I'm not talking about you giving me your ears, just give me your attention. Well, the reason I tell you that is because that is exactly what happens often within the pages of the New Testament. When Paul refers to the cross, he's talking about that part, that part where Jesus died, but he's talking about really the gospel of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus it is a synecdoche to represent the whole, and that's important to understand because the heart of Christianity is the cross. The heart of Christianity is the cross. The Latin word is crux, and I'm sure you've heard someone say, this is the crux of the matter. And when they say that, they're actually saying that what I'm about to say in this argument is central to the argument as surely as the cross is central to Christianity. The cross and the gospel are used interchangeably within the pages of the New Testament. So let me touch the gospel because without this there would be no plan of salvation. There would be nothing. There would be no hope. No hope for eternal life. So as Paul defines the gospel the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, let me hit on each one of those this morning. First, he mentioned the death of Christ. The death of Christ wasn't an accident. Some people believe that when Jesus came, he came to set up the kingdom, but because the Jews rejected him, he deferred and called a play at the line of scrimmage and set up the church instead. And the kingdom's yet to be set up. Well, that makes Jesus mistaken on at least three occasions when he said there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. And the New Testament points to the coming of the kingdom. But the point is, is that so often people miss the death of Christ being central to the gospel. Without that, we would have no hope. It was a part of the plan. It wasn't a call at the line of scrimmage. God wasn't surprised when the Jews rejected Christ. On the contrary, 750 years before Christ was born, Isaiah penned a prophecy. You know the prophecy, Isaiah 53 verses 1 through 8. It begins with Isaiah saying, Who hath believed our report, and to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed? 
He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. Now that prophecy is a direct reference to the coming of the Messiah and his, in fact, going to a cross. Now some people have said, well then why did Isaiah put it in past tense? Why did he say he was stricken? He was beaten? Why did he put it in past tense? Because once God decrees something, it's as good as done. He can speak of it in past tense because it will come to pass. When Jesus was taken in the garden and Peter tried to defend him feebly with his swords... Jesus said, put up your sword. Do you not know that I could presently ask my father and he would give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? Thus, it must be. And he went to that cross. It was the plan of God. Peter would say in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 18 through 20, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Peter makes it absolutely clear that the cross was in the plan of God before the foundation of the world, before the world was ever formed. The foreknowledge and the omniscience of God informed him of all that man would do and all that man would need. And this scarlet thread of redemption started in the mind of God in eternity past and wove itself into time in this world. And it ended at a cross. The cross also, the death was a provision of God. In Matthew the 20th chapter, verse 28, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. In John the 10th chapter, verse 17 through 18, Jesus would actually say, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. The cross was a provision of God. Christ would lay down his life, and then he and all three persons of the Godhead would be active in the resurrection of Jesus. It was the proclamation of God. In John the third chapter, that famous verse, verse 16, but reading on till 18, Jesus said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. That's a proclamation. A proclamation that God loved you so much, Loved me so much 
that he gave his only begotten son in order that you and I might have eternal life. It's in the death of Christ that we proclaim to the world there is a Savior. There is a way to return to God, to have everlasting life. And it was the pleasure of God. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verses 8 through 10, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It's in the death of Christ. It's in the death of Christ that all men can be reconciled. God did not sit in heaven and enjoy the fact that Jesus was being crucified. But he took pleasure in the results of that sacrifice. In the satisfaction of that justice that would take place. And that's in Psalm, Isaiah the 53rd chapter as well. In verse 11, he, speaking of God, shall see the travail of his soul, speaking of Christ, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. We need to understand something about the character of God. And when we get to that part in this series, in the essentials, when we talk about the justice and the holiness and the righteousness of God, it will become apparent. God cannot simply just do things because He's God. Well, I mean, He could, but everybody, demons, the wicked, the lost, the saved, might be asking questions. Why did He do that? In Christ going to the cross, he who had no sin, taking upon himself the sins of all humanity, proved the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, and the justice of God, and shouted to the world the love of God. The cross and hell are built on the same foundation. The justice of God. The wages of sin is death. And Christ paid those wages for you and for me. And the justice of God is now satisfied. And the love of God can be received. But then secondly, Paul says there was a burial. I wonder why sometimes he included it, but I get it. It's proof of death. Let me tell you something. There's a theory out there that Jesus really did not die on the cross. That he just swooned. It's called the swoon theory. That he just passed out. He fainted. And they thought he was dead. And they took him down from the cross. And they put him in the tomb and rolled a thousand pound stone over the door of the tomb. And in the cool of the tomb, the three days of resting and relaxing, he got better. And he rolled away the thousand pound stone with holes in his hands and holes in his feet without the Roman guards hearing him and then went and presented himself to his apostles as being resurrected. Brother, let me tell you something. If you believe that, I got some land I want to sell you. He didn't swoon on the cross. He died on the cross. And after they took him down, they put him in a tomb. He was in that tomb for three days. If he wasn't dead when they took him down, he would have died inside the tomb without any medical attention. Actually, there's a story where Josephus appealed to Titus to request two individuals that were his friends to be taken down from the cross after they had been nailed to the cross, and Titus gave way. They were taken down. Both of them still died. He was buried by two men who were actually a part of the group that condemned him. Though I do not believe that they were participating in his condemnation. They actually went to Pilate seeking the body to bury it. And when they rolled that stone 
over the entrance of that tomb, death had claimed its ultimate prize. Why the burial? Because he died. Proof of prophecy is seen here. Isaiah 53 and verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. The New International Reader's Version says he was given a grave with those who were evil. But his body was buried in the tomb of a rich man. He was killed even though he hadn't harmed anyone. And he never lied to anyone. It was proof for him to be buried in a rich man's tomb. That was a prophecy. Again, 750 years before the events. But it also was proof of payment. When Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says when Jesus had received the sour wine, this was at the end of the crucifixion. When he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When he said it is finished to use the Greek word teleo, it actually means paid. It is paid. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 3 to verse 6, says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. You had been kidnapped by your sin, by the devil, and Christ ransomed you, paid the price with his own blood, and then was buried to prove that he did, in fact, die. It was also emblematic. We're buried with Christ. When we become Christians, when we're born of the water and of the Spirit, when we repent and are baptized for the remission of our sins, Romans the sixth chapter, verses three through four, says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We too, as we begin our life with Christ, are buried and then raised from a watery grave of baptism. It's no accident that Christ instituted immersion, baptism, as the starting point after faith and repentance. And confessing him before men, it's no doubt that baptism is there to remind us of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And when you and I are buried in baptism, we die to ourselves, And then we rise from that watery grave as Christ was raised. And that brings me to the resurrection. The resurrection did a number of things. One, it validated Jesus' claims. In John the 8th chapter verse 28, as Jesus spoke to those who many of those individuals were trying to figure out a way to kill him, he said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Those individuals that were seeking to kill him, they would succeed in their plans. By cooperation with Rome, they would have him lifted up. And I wonder how many of them realized after the event or when that earthquake happened at three and the curtain of the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom, I wonder how many realized that he was the Messiah. In John the 12th chapter 31 and 32, Jesus would say, just before going to the cross, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. Jesus foretold the cross. He foretold the resurrection as well. Those who say that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, that's not true. He claimed it over and over again. Those who claim that Jesus never claimed that he would come out of the grave, he did so over and over again. Matthew 16 and verse 21. 
After Peter had made that great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. After that, the Bible says he began from that time forth to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The resurrection of Christ was foretold by Christ and it validated all of his claims. If I were to tell you that if you kill me, I'm going to come out of a grave in three days, three days later, you'd know I didn't know what I was talking about because I'd still be in the grave. But it validated everything Jesus said. Why? Because he came out of the grave. There was an empty tomb. He was saved by more than 500 brethren at one time. And guess what? The resurrection has so much evidence with it. If we were to put it on trial in a court, it would be confirmed. It validated also that Jesus was innocent. Had Jesus committed one sin in his entire life, that sin would have kept him in the graves. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. James would actually later say, whosoever keeps the whole law and yet offends at one point, he becomes guilty of it all. Why? He becomes sinful. He becomes guilty of breaking God's law. The resurrection of Christ validated that Jesus was innocent. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, Paul would say, For he, speaking of God, hath made him speaking of Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In 1 John, the third chapter, in verse 5, John would tell that church of the first century, and you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. 1 Peter 2, in verse 22, Speaking of Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. It validated. The resurrection validated that Jesus was innocent of sin. He had committed no sin. Not once. He actually at one point challenged those who were seeking to kill him. He said, which one of you convicts me of sin? Name them. And they would not. The resurrection validated that Jesus was sinless. It also validated prophecy. A lot of people think there's no prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to the resurrection of Christ. They're wrong. In Psalms, the 16th chapter, verse 9 and verse 10, David said, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall also rest in hope. Why? For thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol, Neither will you suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, I don't know if you see it, but at the end of that verse that David spoke, he was actually saying there's going to be a resurrection. My flesh will rest in hope. There'll be a resurrection one day. And then he points to the holy one of God and says, and you will not allow him to see corruption. He came out of that grave. He did not rot and decay in a grave. He came out. It validated prophecy. That prophecy came true. It also validated the deity of Christ. In Mark the 14th chapter, in verse 62, Jesus said, I am. You may ask, when did he say that? He was standing before Caiaphas. And Caiaphas actually had put him under an oath and said, Are you the Holy One of God? And he said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. And coming in clouds of heaven. On that first gospel sermon. That Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2 and verse 36. As he comes down to the conclusion of that sermon. He says therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. That God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified. Both Lord and Christ. The resurrection validated the deity of Christ. And when you read through the book of Ephesians and when you read through the book of Colossians, which contains high Christology, there's no doubt whatsoever those books point to the deity of Christ. In Him, all things hold together. Everything in the universe is held together. It's not because of dark matter. It's because of Christ. He is the Word of God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. 
And we need to thank God that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Son of God, full of grace and truth. That passage and that introduction by John goes on down and it says, He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the right to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name. If you believe in Christ, you have the right to become a child of God. That faith doesn't make you one. Despite the majority teaching of most Protestant churches, faith only is dead. That faith has to be alive. It has to bring you to a point of repentance. It has to bring you to a point where you're willing to confess Christ before men. And then to be baptized into Christ. To be born of the water and of the spirit. Jesus would say to Nicodemus, one of the men who took him off the cross and helped bury him. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So, will you receive him? To those of you who have never been baptized into Christ, will you receive him? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But if you will receive him, you have the right, the power to become a child of God if you're willing to repent and confess him before men and be baptized, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Let me tell you something. The cross is central to our lives. Every single day we wake up, we should thank God that he loved us so much that he gave his son to die on a cross so we could live forever.